Good morning. My name is Adam Warski. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Software Mill. We are a software development and consulting company. And today I would like to spend about 10 minutes, probably a couple more, uh, to try to encourage you uh, to check out Scala and try to show some of the productivity benefits that you get uh, when you are using Scala. So why Scala? But before we dive into why Scala, what is Scala? Scala is a strongly typed functional programming language. It runs predominantly on the JVM, but also it compiles down to JavaScript and native bytecode. And I think it is currently the best way to do functional programming in a business in a business setting. So Scala has all of the features, all of the basic features of any of any functional programming language. So we have lambdas, uh, we have functions which can be treated as values. Uh, we have methods which can be converted to functions, which are again values. And the whole language is expression oriented. Everything is an expression, uh, an if is an expression, uh, a switch is an expression, and so on. So this is uh, the basis of really of any functional programming language out there. Uh, we have data classes, we have pattern matching, so all of the basics are covered. But what makes Scala unique are some of the more advanced features, some of the features that are not there in other languages. Um, so for example, we've got term inference. Uh, you might be familiar with type inference. So type inference is when the compiler is smart enough to figure out the type of an expression that we have written. Term inference works the other way around. It's when the compiler is smart enough to figure out the expression basing, basing on the type that we have given it. So these are Scala's implicits. We also have higher order types, which make it possible to create really elegant, uh, concise and expressive uh, DSLs to manipulate your, your data. Scala is also a very regular language. It doesn't really have that many features, but all of the features it has are very general and, and they interact in, in many ways. Some of these combinations of features are really interesting. Some of them are not that interesting, but I think as a community we have learned which combinations to avoid and which to use. Finally, Scala has a quite rich metaprogramming capabilities. Metaprogramming is when you write code, which is run at compile time, it generates more Scala code, which is then translated uh, into bytecode, JavaScript, and so on. But let's look at some, uh, some specifics. So first of all, let's look at data modeling. Um, data modeling is something that we have to do very often, and it's one of the areas where Scala really shines. If you have to model a complex business domain, Scala is a very expressive language and gives you a lot of tools to do that. So here we have a case class. A case class is kind of a data class. All of the instances of a case class will be immutable. Um, so over, uh, once we create an instance, we cannot change uh, any data here. Um, so we have a couple of fields. Uh, one of them is optional. So in Scala, we don't really use nulls and null pointer exceptions and nulls are not really an issue most of the time. And that is because everybody uses options. All of the libraries use options to express, uh, well, optional fields instead of, instead of uh, using nulls. So this is, a this is a simple data class. You can also define uh, data classes which form a uh, hierarchy. So here you have an interface, a trait entity, which has two implementations. That interface is sealed, meaning that all of the implementations that are possible are enumerated in this source file. So it's either a person or a company. And so this means that if you have an instance of an entity, you can be sure that it's either a person or a company and the compiler will verify that for you. Uh, here we also have a collection, um, a, a list in this case of addresses. Um, all of the collections that you are going to be working with by default in Scala, all of them are immutable. So all, all, all of the lists sets, uh, maps, and so on. All of these collections are immutable, are Im immutable by default as well. This brings us to the first productivity gain, which is that Scala is an immutable first language. Um, and this has deep implications uh, when it uh, comes to, to the ecosystem, to the libraries. All of the libraries that are written for Scala, and there's quite a lot of them, uh, work 
predominantly with immutable data structures, with immutable collections, and so on. So this uh, they form a cohesive whole, um, and they they really leverage the fact that immutability that immutability is the preferred way of writing Scala. And this makes things easier to understand. Um, it also makes things partially thread safe, so you have uh, less problems to worry about. Um, Scala is also very expressive when it comes to manipulating data. So let's say we have um, a set of streets. So again, the set is immutable. Uh, let's say we have a set of entities and we want to extract all of the streets corresponding to these entities. So we take those entities and what we do is we extract uh, we extract uh, first the addresses as, as a first stage. So as I said, there are two possibilities. An entity can be either a person or a company. So if it's a person, we take the addresses, convert uh, the addresses to a set. If it's a company, we create a single element set uh, which is the headquarters of a company. That way we obtain a set of addresses and then we can map this to, to the streets uh, and get a set of streets. So this way of manipulating collections and manipulating data is something that's very common in Scala. You are going, you are going to do you are going to work with values like this a lot. And a lot of concepts are represented as values in Scala in general, as we will see later as well. Um, these kind of op operations here, where well, we have been working with an in-memory collection, but they carry over to uh, more complicated uh, structures as well. So for example, if you are manipulating a big data set in Spark, uh, the code will look quite similar. This brings us to the second productivity gain of Scala, which is uh, that the language uh, allows you to create a concise, uh, but still, re uh, still readable, which I think is very important, and type safe code. So type safe, here the compiler will actually verify that uh, we can access the properties uh, that, that we've written and that, for example, here that we have covered all of the cases. Um, and I think the code is concise. Uh, it's not really much you can remove from here. Um, and even if you don't know a lot of Scala, you will probably more or less understand what is happening in that method. But let's let's carry on. Uh, so let's look at some uh, metaprogramming, which I was talking about in the beginning. So quite often, you know, in, in any programming language, we have to do HTTP requests. And when doing HTTP requests, well, we have to serialize data to JSON and deserialize it from JSON. Um, so in other uh, languages, libraries, and so on, quite often the approach that is taken is um, introspecting data classes at runtime, for example, using reflection, and basing on that, doing the uh, serialization and deserialization logic. Here, the approach is different. What we are going to do is we are going to use a method, uh, which is in fact a macro. A macro is something that runs at compile time, generates Scala code, which is then translated further into bytecode. So this, this macro over here, it is parameterized with a type. So the type is the, the input for that, uh, for that method. And it will generate code, which knows how to uh, serialize an instance of an address into JSON. So once we have an instance of an encoder, which is really a function from uh, address to JSON, once we have an instance of that, we can be sure that we know how to serialize that class into JSON, similarly with parsing uh, the response. And all of this happens at compile time. And this brings us to the third product productivity gain, which I wanted to stress over here, um, is that in Scala, we often get compile time proofs instead of runtime tests. So the Scala compiler really verifies a lot of properties for us at compile time. It's true that sometimes it does take some time to actually compile the code, uh, but it takes this time for a reason. Uh, that is because, well, it actually does quite a lot of work uh, checking that our code is uh, is uh, correct when it comes uh, when it comes to the types, and um, quite often instead of running a simple uh, unit or integration tests multiple times, we can just rely on the compiler to verify a lot of these basic properties for us and verify on the more and um, focus on the more complex ones when running the tests. So this brings us to the uh, next 
example. So here we have an example of how you can send an HTTP request using Scala. So what we do is we first describe the HTTP request that we want to send as a value. As I said, we are working with values in Scala a lot. So here we are representing the HTTP request to be sent as a value. You can see that there's the address uh, to which the request should be sent. Uh, there's the body which to include with the request and also a specification of what to do with the response. So you might note here that as a body, we are setting an instance of an address. So what the library needs to know is how to convert this instance of an address into a serialized HTTP body, right? So what it, what, what it needs, it needs an encoder for this, for this type. And actually the compiler will figure out this reference here by itself. And this code will not compile if, there is, uh, if an encoder for an address is not present um, in the current scope. And so here we have an example of the term inference that I was uh, mentioning in the beginning. Uh, so here the body method actually requires or looks up uh, an instance given a, a type. So it needs an encoder for an address type and it looks up an instance, an expression that satisfies the types. Same for the response handling over here. So again, if this code compiles, we can once again be sure that we can actually send uh, this request and parse the response. Uh, so once we have our description of a request ready, which is just a value, we can uh, actually send it using the send function, which you know does all the network stuff that is needed. Uh, and this brings us to another productivity gain of Scala, that in Scala we are mostly using libraries instead of frameworks. So frameworks are very often uh, constraining uh, while libraries give us a lot of uh, flexibility and uh, freedom, so we don't have to fight the, the framework anymore, we can just choose the libraries that work best for our use case. Still, it's worth noting that you know, libraries have to form cohesive uh, packages uh, or they have to work well with each other. So, you know, you have to work, pick libraries. Uh, they, they also like form their own small ecosystems, but still uh, you get a lot more freedom than uh, comparing to, to using a framework. The two libraries that we've been using in this example are HTTP client uh, for HTTP requests and Cersei for handling JSON. Um, so finally, going to the last uh, productivity gain that I would like to mention, um, Scala really emphasizes types and the fact that it's a strongly typed language is one of its main features. It has an advanced type system. The goal of any type system is to make illegal states unre unrepresentable. And I think Scala really pushes the boundary as to how, uh, how many states or how much you can push, uh, how, how, how much you can verify using the type system while still being a practical language. Of course, you, there are still some states that will be illegal, but are representable, but it's a much smaller fraction comparing to other languages. And you know, computers are really intelligent enough to prove a lot of things about our code so that we don't have to test it by hand and so that we don't have to fix it by running and repeatedly running these uh, tests. So we can just delegate a lot of this work to the computer and that's what the Scala compiler does. Finally, I think that tests are really a crucial component, uh, not tests, but types are really a crucial component when it comes to the explorability and the way we can understand and exist a new code base that's, well, a, a code base that is new for us. So tools like autocomplete really help to discover what's available on a data type or what kind of possibilities an API uh, gives us. Um, we also have find usages and go to definition. Uh, which are great tools when exploring a new library or when exploring a new, a new code base. So these are simple tools, I think available in, in any IDE, but they really make a difference. And uh, the fact that the language is typed here also makes it easy to, to actually uh, make these kinds of functional, functionalities possible. It's worth mentioning that uh, Scala 3 is coming up, the next major version of the language. It polishes a lot of the rough edges of Scala 2. Um, 
all of most well most of the features of Scala 2 remain. Some of them are improved. Uh, some new features are added. So take a look at Scala 3 if you are interested. Probably uh, by the end of this year, early next year, we should have a release candidate uh, of of uh, of the language. Um, and uh, that's all that I had. Thank you very much. If you would like to. Uh, start discovering Scala. I can recommend our uh, our Scala starting page, Scala.page. You will find uh, a lot, quite a lot of materials on how to set up uh, your local computer, how to which uh, books to consider, uh, some uh, podcasts, uh, videos, uh, articles, tutorials, and so on. If you're interested in Scala in general, uh, you can subscribe to Scala Times. It's a weekly version of Scala News. And if you have any questions, my DMs on Twitter are open. So feel free to reach out to me. And with that, thank you very much.